Thank you. Well, looks like we're getting a little bit bigger today. <laughs> this is a Corn and Sunday School paper. It's May the 10th, but actually it's June the 27th. Last day in June, last Sunday in June. And uh, I don't know if you've read your lesson, studied it a little bit, hopefully you have. And it's uh it's on page uh seventy one. Is that a recent book up there? Yeah, that's a book right there. Thank you. We had one extra that we got there, so we're all doing okay. Okay, so I know I'm getting old when I look in there and it says uh, 17 instead of 71. <laughs> Crock out of you. Okay, this is uh, June the 27th, the last Sunday in June. Next week is going to be 4th of July on Sunday. That'll be the first time that, uh, and uh, we had a deal. We, I was thinking I was going to be heading to camp on the 5th of July because it was what it was last year, and I called in, told him I might be a little late. I get this phone call back saying, it's a good thing you called in because it's not on the 4th this year. It's going to be on the week of the 12th on it. <laughs> so... So it would have been a great thing to head all the way up there and find out I'm the only one there. <laughs> so. Okay, before we get started, let's have a word of prayer. Our dear, kind, heavenly, loving, wonderful, gracious, almighty God. Lord, we come before you this morning as we learn this lesson. Lord, help us to, help me to be able to put in the important points that need to be in this lesson and help us dear Lord to be what you want for us to be and to do what you want for us to do so take us and guide us through this lesson fill us with your Holy Spirit this morning and fill us with your love for each other and we thank you and we praise your holy wonderful gracious almighty name Our lesson starts with a, a statement. And think about it for a minute. That is called, failure is not final. Is that a yes or a no or a maybe? What do you think? Times you fail it, so it's a good sight on earth. <laughs> yeah, that's one thing. I think we already had the. Uh... Oh, looks like there's some. Of them. Okay. Let's see, what was the date on these things here? I brought up I brought up a couple from the last couple weeks in case anybody missed was missing them and then I brought up an extra one for today. Oh, okay. And so that's Thank why well, that's why there's some that have previous dates on them. Okay. Thank you. Yep. Okay. Failure is not final. Can it be final? I think it can. It all depends how we react to it. And this is a story, I think a lot of us may know this story, this is a story of Samson. And what a mighty fellow he was. And our verses today are in two different 
chapters, chapter 13, 2 through 5, and chapter 16, 23 through 31. Samson is, uh, Samson is often pictured as a muscular man with a suburb physique. What, if anything, do you admire about bodybuilders, the Mr. Universal type, universe types? What, if anything, repels you about such people? In today's lesson, we find a young man who was physically strong, but at times morally weak. We need to watch for this contrast. Samson did not always live a good life. Samson made some poor choices. And Samson made choices that was not for his benefit or for his welfare. And in the uh, and in our first section here, we, write, we listen to when God calls us, he sets us apart. God, has God ever called us to do something? Has God ever called you to talk to somebody? Or has God ever talk, called you to maybe go someplace? Or maybe has God guided you somewhere without you realizing that? you're hidden where you need to even though you were lost and bewildered and forsaken. I think we all have it one time. I know Friday uh, when I had to go to the eye doctor in Jackson, we went over to where Sears used to be and they had that all fenced off there now. We went to, what was that store we went to? Kohl's? Yeah, you got it. All right, I went to Kohl's, but then when we got out, got kind of twisted around a little bit. By the time I stopped at a gas station, a lady was there, and I told her where I wanted to go. She said, oh, just go down this way to the first light, turn left, go down to the next light, turn left, and you'll be right there. <laughs> Show us how God guides us when we need when we need his guidance. And he also guides us when we're not even aware of it. And in, chapter, in verse 2, we read, And there was a certain man of Zorah, of the family of the Danites, whose name was Moniah, and his wife was barren, and bare not. An angel of the Lord appeared unto the woman, and said unto her, Behold now, thou art barren, and bearest not, but thou shalt conceive, and bear a son. Now therefore, beware, I pray thee, and drink not wine, not strong drink, and eat, and eat not any unclean thing. For lo, you shall conceive and bear a son, and no razor shall come to on his head, and the child shall be a Nazarite unto the God from the womb, and he shall begin to deliver Israel out of the hand of the Philistines. And that, what is a Nazarite? A Nazarite was somebody who mostly would, would say, I want to be a Nazarite maybe to do this or do something else. Very seldom was anyone called to be a Nazarite even before he was even conceived. And Samson was chosen to be this. And also the things that he had to do Part of it, his, his mother had to do too. Back in the biblical days, being childless was a reproach unto the wife. A wife was expected to bear children, especially boys, because it was the boy who would be carrying on the family name. It would be the boy who carried on carried on the family. And if there was more than one son, he would get the double portion of the inheritance plus the blessing of the father. And he would also 
the others would divide what would be left over. To be there, you know, that was sometimes desired. The great emphasis was placed on having children. Though a son of the family name would be preserved, and the benefits of a son included provision for his parents in their old age. So he was also taking care of his parents when they were old. But here was a, a family who was, did not have a, a son at this point, did not even have a daughter. And they were going to be what they what God wanted the, the this part of the family would be written off the record because there'd be nobody to carry on the family name. And God had a God had a plan for Samson's life, even before his birth. The angel of the Lord appeared to the wife of a man named Mananoah, and he told her that she would become pregnant and give birth to a son even though she had been barren and childless up to that time. This is similar to the condition of Elizabeth, mother of John the Baptist. We all remember Elizabeth was on the downhill slide of life. As the old uh, adage put it, one foot in the grave and the other on a banana peel. And God said, you're going to have a son who's going to proclaim the Messiah. And other mothers in the Bible, Genesis 11, 30, well, I didn't get a chance to look that up. The angel in, in, indicated her son would be a Nazarite and would be dedicated to God from the womb. The word Nazarite means separated or dedicated. Samson's life from the time he was conceived, he was to be a Nazarite. And God had put certain conditions on him and on his mother of, way, of the way she had to live. Typically, a person taking a Nazarite vow would abstain from any fermented drink, eat nothing from the grapevine, use no razor on the head, never approach a dead body. Only the hair requirement is mentioned here in regard to the baby. Now her the mother had was instructed that she was to abstain from wine or other fermented grain and avoid eating anything unclean. Dedicated children needs dedicated parents. Although Samson's mother was singled out, his father was dedicated, also dedicated. When the child was born, his parents were elated naming him Samson, meaning sun or brightness. Normally, being a Nazarite would be a voluntary thing. It's like maybe you feel God has called you to be, to take a certain amount of time to do something that God may have indicated to you to do. But God chose Samson and made it clear that he was to keep his vow from the womb to the day of his death. This was a lifelong, this was a lifelong thing. And God, I think, was saying this, that when we come to God, we dedicate our lives to him. We dedicate our life completely to him. We live the way he wants us to live. We do the things he wants us to do. And he be and he's with us when, wherever he wants us to be. And we need to understand something in here is uh, the reason was that God was to take the lead in delivering Israel from the hands of the Philistines. 
This, the emphasis is on begin because Samson did not fully deliver his people. That deliverance continued under Samuel and came to completion under David. You see, you know, we, we kind of look at Samson and we say, here is this man, strong, courageous, but we need to understand one thing. Samson did not always have the superhuman strength at all the time. When God moved him, God would give him the strength he needed to take care of what he needed to take care of. So where is the real power? The real power is in God. And also another thing is we said that we may say that if he had been like a general he never led an army. He did everything on his own. And maybe in the process he got a little conceited and maybe a little high-handed. But we need to understand God did not say that Samson was going to completely eliminate the Philistines. He said this was only going to be the start of it. We are to offer our bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God, which is in Romans 12, 1. When we refuse to conform to the patterns of this world, but rather allow God to renew our minds, we will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. We are wise we accept his plan, setting us apart to do his work, for the expansion of his kingdom. What is God expecting us to do as people? He wants us to live lives that are wholly consecrated to him. And uh, I did. I kind of skipped this a little bit. But let's back up a little bit. This Sick, sanctify. Have you ever wondered about that word? I know I was raised in this church and stuff. But sanctification, sanctify, sometimes can be a hard word to pin down. What is God talking about here? When we're talking about being sanctified. In this here, we put down is that we are to be set aside for a holy purpose. From that time when we come before God, we say, God, I want you in my life. I acknowledge that I'm not perfect. I acknowledge that I am a sinner. Now that is a hard thing for most people to acknowledge. I'm a sinner. I've never done anything bad to anybody. i never robbed anybody. i never killed anybody. i never held up anybody, whatever it is. But does God say good people will automatically go into heaven? No. God did not say that. Because it says in the Bible, and I'm not sure exactly where it is, but I know it says, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. That when we come to him, you know, sometimes I think we've been duped into thinking that we have to do this long search for sanctification. Sanctification can begin when we truly accept Jesus as Lord and Savior, when we truly says, I am dedicating, the sanctification can come at that moment. That does not mean we still don't have issues in our life. That does not mean that we still don't have things in our lives that we need to work, to work on. These are very important. 
And God says, be holy because I am holy. We can never be as holy as God is on this earth. But when we get up to heaven, we will have that. Our job on earth is to live for him. And to do what he wants for us to do. And to be what he wants us to be. We are to offer ourselves, our bodies, as a living sacrifice. You know, I don't think at our age, you know, you know I'm not going to say God ain't going to do this. Because sometimes God, a lot of times God likes to kind of say, uh, I don't think God's going to call us to go to the missionary in Africa or Caribbean or some other place. But maybe you don't know. Sometimes people do short-term missionary work, maybe a retired doctor, or maybe a doctor who had decided, I want to go down and help people physically. Or maybe somebody's, or maybe a bunch of college students may want to maybe offer a deal to go down and help rebuild some houses that were killed in an earthquake, tornado, or whatever. Just because we're at retirement age does not mean that God is not done with us. Retirement from this life is when we're not here anymore. And I've seen and I've seen and heard of people bedridden who spent many, many hours in prayer for different things. I used to have a lady on my route that when I first became a Sunday school teacher and I let her know about it, she went to a different church than I did where she didn't go because she couldn't get out anymore. First thing she said was, Dave, I'm going to be praying. Prayer is very important. I was talking to my brother. And he said that he went to my mom's house. mess. Mom looked at him. Said the only thing I remember that night was the hood look on my mother's face. She cleaned my brother up put him on the couch when he woke up he just walked out because he was too ashamed to face her day or two went by he went over there apologized to mom and mom says come here I'll show you something she took him down into the basement our grandfather had made a stool for my mother with the wrong handle on it so she didn't bend over to pick it up. He says, you see that stain there by the furnace? Say yes. Those are my tears for you, for your brother, for your sister. And it says very prayer. I kind of had to ask myself a question. When have I last truly interceded for a loved one, a friend, or anybody else? I'd have to say it's been a long time. 
And I do believe there were probably many times my intercessory prayer in the basement was for me. It was for my brother and for our sister. And probably for a lot of other folks. Folks, we've kind of gotten away from what is important what is what we really need. I'm sorry that I kind of get off the track there, but I feel this is where God is leading me to go. I think that's why we're in the shape we're in today, because there's so many people today that can't pray or just don't want to take the time and you get so many people that need so much help, and, and God will open a door every time, and, and he'll, he'll guide you to some of those people, but sometimes you have to time to close the door because there's so many people wanting everything all at once, sometimes you can't keep up. That's true, that's true. And I was reading, I was I reading that, that. I was reading that this morning a little bit, where this one guy, who was getting behind on his prayers with a prayer book and stuff. That's, you know, prayer is hard work. Heartfelt prayer. I think we've been deluded to where we're not talking about what we don't do much anymore. We need what God can give us. And we need what God can do for us. And we need all these different things. And, it's, and we're going to go into this next session here for a little bit. Where Now through this time, they're kind of skipping into chapter 16, because through this time, we know the, the story of Samson wanted a Philistine woman for a wife. And on the marriage thing there, he had made a bet for 30 feet, for 30 uh, suits of clothing that they couldn't guess his riddle. And the, and the, and the Philistines told the bride, unless you tell get us to, what, to let us know what it is, we're going to we're going to kill you and your family and turn your house into a outside bathroom about what it amounted to. And so, and so Samson did some things. And Samson did some bad things. Then he, get, then he gets mixed up with Delilah. We all know about this lovely lady. And in the course of time, he... He gives, you know, he keeps teasing her, but you notice that in his teasing, he gets closer and closer and closer and closer to what God had said he could and should not be doing. And that is his hand. And in the last part of it, we read, Now the rulers of the Philistines assembled to offer a great sacrifice to Dagon, their God and to celebrate saying our God has delivered Samson our enemy into our hands when the people saw him they praised their God saying our God has delivered our enemies into our hands and the one who laid waste our land and multiplied our slain and we were skipping over some of the uh, parts here that in this lesson there, but in this, but in page 74, we can kind of read uh, how they uh, were going to sacrifice to their God, Dagon, that they had delivered, that they had delivered him into their hands. And I've told you that Samson never had that real power all the time, but when God moved him, he had the power to do those things that he did. 
One time he took 300 foxes, tied them together in pairs, and set a firebrand on their tails and let them loose. And they ran through the fields, burning up the crops. Then there was another time when, uh, when a young lion ro roared to him when he was uh, there, and he grabbed the lion and tore him apart. And later on, uh, some bees infested the, what was left of the lion, and, and he got a honeycomb out of it, and he ate it on the way home. During, and during the, well anyway, I was like, told you about the future wife who betrayed him, and he had to get 30 suits of clothes, so he killed 30 Philistines and gave their clothes to the people. And Samson got involved with Delilah, which goes to show we got to be careful who we associate with. Not all pretty girls are pure. Not all pretty girls are like they should be. A lot of times even handsome men aren't what they seem to be either. And so they... And, uh, and we get down to the point to where Samson says, if you cut off my hair, I will not have any strength. And then he fell asleep, and she took a razor and cut all his hair off. And, uh, and so he, they took him, so they, they, uh, she said, the Philistines are coming upon you, and he went to battle them off, but they captured him, gouged his eyes out, and put him to work in a, in a running this granny wheel to grind uh, wheat into a meal, into flour. A lot of people think the secret of his success was the hair. It was not. The hair was strictly a symbol that God is with us, that God was with him. And he came to that point to where that when the hair was gone, God was gone too. Can we lose God? I think we can. Some people say we can, but that's, uh, well, that's a speculative. The real secret of his strength was the Spirit of the Lord. God wants to equip us for service as well. The difference is that the Spirit came upon Samson on occasion, but he wants to abide in our hearts continuously. Does God abide in our hearts all the time? Or do we get angry? Or do we start wishing somebody ill will? Or do we not do it like we're supposed to? And those are the times when we need to get down and say, God, forgive me. Help me to be better. And I pray for your forgiveness. And God will give it to you. And Jesus had said, who had promised his disciples when Jesus was going to be leaving this earth. He said, I will send you a comforter. Jesus on this earth was on one-on-one -on -one or with a group. Here, the comforter, the Holy Spirit, can abide into each and every single Christian, Christian in the world. He's with me. He's with you. He's with all of us. I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate to help you and be with you forever, the Spirit of Truth. Later he declared, I'm going to send to you what my Father has promised. But he told them to stay in the city. And after he was in the, but after about 40 days, the Holy Spirit came. And these guys who had been with Jesus for three years, 
became the leaders of the early church. And God wants to be, wants to be in us too. And here is the, and the last last section here we did was, and it came to pass when their hearts were were merry, that they called, they said, call for Samson that he may make us sport, and they called for Samson out of the prison house, and he made them sport, and they sat him between the pillars, and Samson said unto the lad that held him by the hand, suffer me that I may fill the pillars whereon the house standeth, that I may lean upon them. Now the temple was crowded with men and women. All the rulers of the Philistines were there. And on the roof were about 3,000 men and women watching Samson perform. And Samson prayed to the Lord, Sovereign Lord, remember me. Please, God, strengthen me just once more. And let me, with one blow, give revenge on the Philistines for my two eyes. Then Samson reached toward the two central pillars on which the temple stood, bracing himself against them, his right hand on the one and his left hand on the other. Samson said, let me die with the Philistines. Then he pushed with all his might, and down came the temple on the rulers and on all the people in it. Thus he killed many more than he did while he lived. Then his brothers and his father's whole family went down to get him. They brought him back and buried him between Zorah and Eshekel in the tomb of Manoah, his father. He had led Israel 20 years. Here is the end. Did Samson repent? I think he did. And there's a... When the Philistine captured Samson, they gouged out his eyes. Physical blindness was a metaphor for his spiritual blindness because he had lost sight of God's purpose and God's presence. Can we be spiritually blind? I think we can if we allow it to happen. And they put him to work grinding grain in the prison. In time his hair began to grow again. On this day, great crowds assembled in the temple area to celebrate the capture of Samson. I'm going to ask you a question here. It says, his hair began to grow again in prison. How come nobody noticed it? I don't think we can even notice, you know, hair comes out and grows so, grows so slowly that it probably came and, and uh, nobody noticed it. Maybe God did this. Who knows? But when they brought him out of prison, he was asked the servants to bring him to where he could fill the pillars that supported the temple. Lifting his heart to God, the fallen hero prayed, Please, God, strengthen me just once more. Please, God, take me back. Please, God. Let me be able to do this. What other thing in the Bible might bring to mind something similar to this? Here was Samson who was about ready to die. You remember that one thief on the cross with Jesus? He couldn't get baptized. But he said, when you come into your kingdom, remember me. This is probably sometimes called getting by the skin of your teeth and getting into heaven. But
but Lord, but we need to understand. We may not be wind up on a cross. We may wind up in a in a sick bed, or we may die instantly in a car accident. We need to be ready. And he said, "Do this." And there was a question here. He said, "What do you suppose Samson thought about while he was?" grinding grain in the Philistine prison. What would you think about? Hopefully, he thought about the mistakes he had made and resolved to obey God once more. Samson said, please, let me do this. And he told the boy to Take him to the two posts that are holding up the temple. So the boy took him there. He put one hand on one pillar and he put another hand on the other pillar. And the Lord blessed him. We don't know how many people were killed that day, but no, there was at least 3,000 on the roof, not counting what was down in the main area. And he struck a blow against the pagans by destroying their temple. In spite of his colossal failures, he turned back to God, and the Lord used him once again. Although Samson has received considerable bad, pr bad press, he nevertheless Marbleized in the Believer's Hall of Faith in Hebrews 11.32. Our lives do not have to end as tragically as his did. We may fail. We may blow it. We may think, God, how can you keep loving me? God's love is so wonderful. God's love is so great that even when we fail, even when we are not doing what he wants for us to do, even when we make that bad decision, We, I guess, evidently, being sin is still in the world. We still get Satan is not being Satan is being busy. He is still doing all the things that he wants to do to keep us from him. Satan may say, "You messed up. You've done shot your wife. There's no more." with a sincere and faithful heart. God comes to us. When we ask him to, he will come. And that he will forgive us. And that he will be who we want for us to be. It is better if we don't stray from the Lord. However, if you have strayed, don't give up. Don't let one failure or many disqualify you for life. Pick yourself up. Seek God's forgiveness and cleansing. And go forth to new achievements in the power of the Holy Spirit. He will empower you to serve us again in spite of our failures. Our dear, kind, heavenly, loving, wonderful, gracious
Lord, take what we have said, not for our glory. But Lord, use it to further your kingdom. Use it to show us that Satan may say that we have blown it. There ain't no sense of trying. But you say, come to me. Repent. And I will make you clean. Lord, help us that we may always be willing to take care of what you may bring before us. And we acknowledge you that you are our Lord and our Savior. And we thank you for your goodness and for your mercies. Bless each one who is here. Bless each one who listens to this video. And in Jesus' wonderful, gracious, almighty name.